Welcome to Insights into Northeast Michigan, a WBKB News public affairs program. Insights deals with the issues affecting those within the community, as well as Northeast Michigan and the state. And now, Insights into Northeast Michigan. Welcome to Insights, I'm Sherry Stewart. This week we're spending some time in downtown Alpena as many of our local businesses are starting to come back online. We'll be visiting with a couple businesses to get their take on COVID-19 and how they have maneuvered this crisis. Well, we are kicking off our conversation today with Mary Olivet of Olivet Book and Gift right here in downtown Alpena. We're so excited to be with you today, Mary. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy you're here. Absolutely. You know, I just love bookstores and you have a really uh, just wonderful, inspirational story about how you got started. So let's just start off with that. Okay. So uh, we moved here in 1983 and we really enjoyed having the access that we had with Adam's bookstore at mm -hmm. the time. And when they closed, we found ourselves going over to Gaylord mm -hmm. at least once or twice a month on a Saturday mm -hmm. afternoon with our little kids. And, yeah. and uh, one day the gal at the Word bookstore over there said, oh, where are you from? And we said, Alpina. And she said, oh, must be Alpina Day. Mm -hmm. So we decided that we needed to do something about that, that our community needed their own Christian bookstore, inspirational mm -hmm. bookstore. So we started looking for that and looking for a place and and uh, we actually didn't find what we were looking for and mm -hmm. it took about a year and we just decided, you know, if the place isn't right, mm -hmm. we need to just wait. Sure. And so we did and one fine day we got a call and this location was available to us. Okay. We came in, we counted it a huge blessing sure. and we opened about 10 months later. Wow, what an inspirational story. So fast forward, so uh, maneuvering now through the COVID-19 and, and all of that and you're back open. So share with us some of the things that you did to stay connected with your, your precious uh, audience, your customers. You did some very innovative things. So tell us about that. It was a devastating time and we had been watching for weeks. Mm -hmm. Our schools had been shut down because kids were sick, bus drivers were right. sick, you know, teachers were sick. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly one fine day, you know, we got the word, mm -hmm. everything is done. Right. So I came into work on a Monday mm -hmm. and I told the girl that was working, mm -hmm. don't come back tomorrow. Mm -hmm. We're done, we're closed. And so during that process of time, mm -hmm. uh, I came in every day from 10 o'clock to 2 o'clock to keep connected with people. Mm -hmm. Plus, you know, when you have a business, it is, it is a living thing. Mm -hmm. uh, there are still packages coming in. There are still phone calls happening. There are still emails coming. And um, even though it was quiet and I was in here by myself, I decided that I needed to connect with my customer base and if I had any intention of having a customer base at the end of this, right. I needed to maintain relationship. So I started doing everything I knew how to do, which means how do people who are sitting in their house Because there was a lot of that. Shop, right? <laughs> right. They, what do they do? They sit and they get on their phone or their computer mm -hmm. and they shop, they look, mm -hmm. they read. And so pretty much, I was like Olivet Amazon mm -hmm. <laughs> as much as I could be 24-7 for almost eight weeks. So that means I was keeping in touch with people by doing audio, video mm -hmm. connections on Facebook sure. just about daily. And then when people were contacting me on Facebook or email or texting me because they had all of my information. Mm -hmm. I was connecting with them at 6 o'clock in the morning, at 11.30 at night. If somebody said, hey, do you have this book? And it was 10.30 at night, I was saying, yes. I was doing curbside the whole time. See, as a sole owner, I had the legal right to come in and take care of my business. I couldn't have my employees do it. And frankly, I love to connect with my people. So I didn't mind doing that. But 
it was exhausting and, um, and rewarding. And I feel like over that eight weeks that we were actually shut down, because of the way I was relating to people on literally a 24-7 basis, as they had a thought, I was able to answer that or I was able to talk to them about something. I gained about 300 uh, likes mm -hmm. on Olivet Facebook page in about six weeks. Wow. Which, which was, I think, huge for me, and it has really helped. Mm -hmm. so, so what are some of the, the key learnings that you've come away with with this? I know many businesses have found out that um, because they have had to uh, perhaps allow uh, telecommuting, a lot of, uh, what is it, Zoom meetings, using a lot of technology to continue with their business. Mm -hmm. And you've obviously learned how to connect with your audience on uh, Facebook and other platforms. What did that show you about um, this particular business? Well, what it tells me about me is that I am not tech savvy, okay? <laughs> so, like, um, me becoming super, super woman, tech woman, mm -hmm. over that short period of time did not happen. But I'm very um, comfortable with my Facebook videos. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I really um, did like was that I was doing Facebook Live. So, and I was doing FaceTiming. So most people have a smartphone. Mm -hmm. And so I was talking to people, um, usually during that 10 to two period of time, when I would set up an appointment, maybe the evening before and say, when they were looking for a book or a Bible or a piece of jewelry or something as a gift for somebody, um, maybe it was just even a box of cards. Yeah. I would say, okay, I'm gonna be in the store. Can you FaceTime me or I FaceTime you at 10.15 tomorrow morning? And they'd say, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we would get on and we would look at each other and we would say, wow, it's you. And we would walk around the store and I would show them things. I. I even tried on a couple of things so people could see, well, what do you think about that? Because they'd say, oh, my mom is about your size. Can uh -huh. you put that T-shirt on? So I was doing all kinds of things, FaceTiming, and that was a wonderful way to connect. Uh -huh. The other thing that I found that people were so sad about being by themselves, and they also wanted to be reaching out to people. I think right. we've, we've discovered that yeah. we really want to connect. Mm -hmm. And that's what, as you were saying, that mm -hmm. is, it's, it was very difficult right. because we missed that connection. Now that you're back online, what are some of the safety precautions that you've put in place as we uh, continue to maneuver mm -hmm. COVID-19? What are some of the safety things in place for your, your uh, customers as they come into the store? We totally, totally had lots of things we mm -hmm. had to do to prepare for yeah. it. And uh, I was all about it because I wanted people to come in and feel completely safe mm -hmm. and comfortable and enjoy their experience. Otherwise, why would they want to come? So we installed uh, a plexi wall in front of the cash register and along the side. Sanitizing things were really tough to get, so we had to really scour, but um, we were able to get some of that locally too. <laughs> and uh, so we have hand sanitizing station at the front which is an infrared so they don't have to touch it they just put their hand oh. underneath right at the front door I have it at the cash register mm -hmm. we have spray so that we can wipe down the credit card machine the pen that they've used mm -hmm. the counter that they've been on uh, we wear masks every day mm -hmm. uh, all the employees are required and actually when somebody comes through the door um, they are asked if they have a mask and if they don't, sometimes they have them in their purse and they pull them out and they say, oh yeah, yeah, because I am on the corner, yeah. which means some people have come in from the outside and may have not had it on outside. Mm -hmm. So they put that on or I give them one. Okay. And I kind of feel like everybody downtown has done their part mm -hmm. to prepare a safe, enjoyable shopping experience. Well, we want people to come back. 
but we want people to come back too. Yeah. And so that's that's all of our time today, Mary. But I really want to thank you for uh, for uh, kicking off the conversation with us thank today. You. Thank and you. And best of luck to you thank as you. you continue to as thank we continue you. to maneuver this season. That's right. The important thing is to remember shop local. Absolutely. Yep. Insights will return after these messages. Before we head over to our next stop, we wanted to share with you our interview with Governor Whitmer conducted just a couple weeks ago. She shared some of her thoughts on this entire crisis. Well, first off, Governor, I want to thank you for the opportunity today um, and just jump right into our questions. We know that uh, our COVID numbers are down significantly. That's wonderful news. As you reflect back on the handling of this pandemic, is there anything that you would do differently as we are at this point now? Well, we're still dealing with a novel virus and the amount that we've learned about COVID-19 in the last 10 weeks has been exponential and every day we're learning more. I was just looking, watching Dr. Fauci testifying before Congress. You know, that's the nature of a novel virus. You don't know a lot about it. It's new. There's no vaccine. There's no cure. And so every single day, the best we could do is make sure we're trying to understand the science and listening to the, the best experts in epidemiology. We're working with the University of Michigan Public Health and Dr. Janae Caldoun, our mm -hmm. chief medical executive. And so each decision is made in, in rapid succession because of how you know, tough those early days were for us with COVID-19. Um, in retrospect, now that we know a lot more, would we have done some things differently? Probably, you know, but at the time with the information that we had, uh, I think we've made some really important decisions and studies have shown that um, because we took this on so aggressively, thousands of lives were saved. And at the end of the day, um, I will sleep at night knowing that the actions we took saved thousands of people. Um, I will always worry, were, was there more we could do? Were there different decisions we could have made? And of course, uh, with 2020 vision, uh, looking backward, there's always gonna be the case, but um, we've done an incredible amount of work here and, and we have to keep our guard up. Mm -hmm. We know that nursing homes and congregate care facilities are uniquely vulnerable mm -hmm. uh, with an older population, many of whom mm -hmm. also have additional medical vulnerabilities. And so um, as we look to the fall and we look to the days ahead, it's really important we keep our guard up and we keep masking up and, and washing our hands and we're always safer at home uh, when so long as COVID-19 is here and, and it's going to be here until we have a vaccine. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that. And with that, then this leads me to my next question. What are some of the key learnings that we can take away? Because it's been new for everyone from uh, learning how to uh, telecommute. Some thought that they couldn't do that and still run their business. So what have been some of the key learnings for the state of Michigan? Yeah, well, I think, you know, I was talking to our state treasurer, Rachel Eubanks, uh, yesterday, mm -hmm. and she said, you know, the Department of Treasury has done, has gotten more work done um, in this moment because we have really upped our game when it comes to the technology and being able to work from home. And there were doubts at the beginning if we were going to be able to do everything or if we really needed to bring people in. Um, she was, you know, pleased to report that their productivity actually has increased. That's pretty amazing. So I think that, you know, there are things that we have all learned as we've navigated this. And, talking with some of the small businesses that are opening. I was at a bookstore in Detroit the other day and um, this uh, woman and her daughter own this bookstore and they have done a lot of online sales. Her daughter helped uh, with a coalition of locally owned bookstores to create a site online and they've been filling orders that way. So um, we've, you know, we're nimble, we're tough. Some things you can't um, navigate mm -hmm, in the midst right. of a global pandemic, others you can, and those that you can, I hope we we um, we learn and we take those lessons going forward. Okay, and then we in this region, Northeast region, we still continue to get comments from some of our viewers that they're still having a struggle getting through to unemployment to file for benefits. As you look back and we look at things that we can kind of tweak, are there plans to look at that entire system to make it a little bit more streamlined, a little bit more user friendly? What are some of the things that you may have in place to address that issue? Yeah, so it's frustrating. I, I will I will absolutely commiserate with people that have struggled. We've gotten to 93% of the claims, um, and, and that is a, a pretty miraculous thing, considering that 
uh, for eight years that system was under invested in and barriers were created between the unemployed and their benefits and there frankly just weren't enough people at the agency this is a situation um, the level of unemployment that we have is unlike anything we've ever seen so it was a system that was not prepared and then a need that was greater than anything anyone anticipated we have worked really hard to quintuple the number of people at unemployment to um, fill you know all of these um, applications mm -hmm. and we've gotten a 93 percent we've moved over 11 billion dollars over the course of this pandemic and yet it's cold comfort to the 7% we haven't gotten to. And that's why we are gonna to continue to work until every person who's eligible gets every dime for which they are eligible. And um, our my, my hope, of course, is that on the other side of the crisis, mm -hmm. that we can prioritize that agency and get support out of the legislature to do that and to make it easier for people who are unemployed to navigate it. Mm -hmm. I unilaterally fix some of that through executive order, but ultimately will take legislation to codify that. Okay, and this is my last question. I don't wanna run out of my time. Um, how confident are you that we can return to in-person uh, education for our students? I see that the legislators have come up with their own return uh, to learn pl uh, pr uh, plan. What are your thoughts on that? And do you think that that will be something that will be feasible for us in the coming months? Yeah, so today the Republican legislators put out a plan. It is actually um, a, the DeVos plan from the Great Lakes Education Project. It's a one pager. What we're working on is a real plan. We've brought experts to the table to make sure that we're thinking through all of the implications. These are experts from different disciplines within our schools, from different geographies across our state, um, so that we can do this right. And a one pager is nice but a plan to keep our kids safe and our educators safe and all of their families as all as well um, is really important. So that is going to be done uh, uh, June 30th and uh, we'll have ample opportunity to really uh, delve into how we make that a reality and so that our kids are safe as we as we return to learn. Okay, and lastly, is there anything else that you would uh, like to say specifically to our viewers here in Northeast Michigan? Yeah, I would simply say, you know, we have made a, a great sacrifice to get people, get Michigan into a strong position when it comes to COVID-19 and to contain this, this virus. People have sacrificed, um, you know, their, their jobs, right? They have sacrificed um, some businesses might not make it through this. We know that we've lost almost 6,000 people in our state to COVID-19, and yet um, we are now in a leadership position, and 48 other states are looking to figure out how do they, how do, they do it like we did. We can't drop our guard now. COVID-19 is still present, and it is still deadly. It can be asymptomatic for one person in the house and, and fatal for another. And that's why every one of us has to keep doing our part. Let's not have made these sacrifices in vain. Let's let's get stronger. Let's continue to mask up and to, to do what we know we need to do to stay safe. Okay. Well, I want to thank All you right. for your time today. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you, for, thank you for coordinating this for us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Insights will return after these messages. Welcome back to Insights. Next up, we'll be stopping in with a local salon owner to talk with them about the steps they've taken to protect themselves and their customers. And joining me now to continue our conversation is Jesse Fisher with Headlines Family Salon. Thanks for uh, spending time with us today. Thank you. Well, I know that you're excited to be back online, but more importantly, your customers are excited to be back in the chair. Absolutely. Everyone's really happy to be back in the salon. Yeah, so with the downtime that we had, what did you learn about this business? I learned um, that everyone finds this business much more essential than they have previously. Mm -hmm. um, I think more so than just the physical aspect of feeling good about yourself, mm -hmm. but the human inter interaction and the human touch does a lot for everybody, especially being isolated, you understand that more, being at home mm -hmm. and alone. And I know we were uh, just joking off camera that we've seen some interesting hair colors and cuts oh, over these last couple weeks. Uh -huh. So, From wives cutting husband's hair to people cutting their own hair and 
wives and husbands cutting each other's hair. It's been very interesting. It's been very, <laughs> yeah. very interesting. So I know that uh, there are a lot of safety precautions that businesses are putting in place to protect themselves as well as the customers. Tell me about some of the things that you've done here. Um, we have, we're a very small salon, so that very much works on our favor. We don't have a large capacity anyways, but we did remove our waiting area. Um, put our, our stations already six feet apart. Our dryer chairs are now six feet apart. We can't serve coffee, we can't serve magazines, anything that's multiple touch mm -hmm. and hard to sanitize. Mm -hmm. um, we're not um, double booking, we're trying to keep as many um, appointments just as one person as possible. If somebody needs a caregiver, they can come in, but um, we're asking that spouses or friends to come with anybody. Don't um, have anyone accompany to your appointment. We're wearing our PPE to keep everyone safe, asking the clients to wear a mask. Um, if you have a homemade mask getting hair color, we do provide a um, disposable one so we don't ruin your mask. And we are sanitizing in between every client, washing our hands, um, using disinfectants on the doors and frequently touched areas also. So just an incredible amount of uh, sanitizing Absolutely. and making sure that you're that you're keeping customers safe. And I know that your customers appreciate that. Absolutely. I'm sending out text messages to my clients before they come in so that they're aware of what the protocol is and so they're prepared when they come in so it's not a surprise to anyone that they have to wear a mask. And um, I have it all listed on my website also mm -hmm. on everything that the government um, recommends of us and requires of us. Now what kind of feedback have you gotten from your customers? Um, everyone's very happy that we are keeping them safe and looking out. Um, some people have been hesitant to come back to the salon, just the nature of the business being so close, but are feeling better after maybe coming and getting a haircut before they come in for a two-hour color service. Um, but everything that we do and how clean the salon is has really kept them feeling safe. Now, throughout this entire pandemic, have you thought of new ways to perhaps expand or diversify your business? We've seen a couple salons that are uh, doing online tutorials or things of that nature. Have you thought about that? I have. With um, a lot of education that I'm a part of, I'm also a brand consultant, a brand educator for uh, the brand of products that I carry. So definitely giving tips on how to use products, doing curbside pickup for those products, and instructing clients to do things at home that aren't necessarily going to compromise their hair in the future, but be able to deal with what they have to at home. Now, as you say, uh, there is a lot more, uh, I would say, a newfound respect for the personal care industry. Yes, for somebody that really wants to get into uh, hairstyling and, and beauty essentials, what is the path, a way of entry to this? Um, it's a trade so you're going to go to a trade school to a cosmetology school for about a year um, i have taught in beauty schools in the past and am a licensed instructor and it's definitely a career that you have to have a passion for you have to love people be creative love to talk to people and be a hard worker just like all trades you have to it can be a great career and very plentiful but you have to put the work in for it now are there local uh, programs in this area that if unfortunately people are... our cosmetology school has closed oh. um i think i believe it was last summer when the um when the owner passed away ah, okay. so we don't have a school right now but there are some in surrounding areas i do believe mm -hmm. now what is it that you love most about this industry I love the people and I love the creative release. I, when I was home for three months, I was painting and knitting and drawing, trying to express my creativity in a way. Um, but when I'm behind the chair, I do that with a different medium. I use bleach and color and scissors instead of paint and paper. So it sounds like at the core of this, uh, this industry is about uh, creation and personal expression. It is, absolutely. Um, and feel like almost like a therapist too, being able to talk with people and the physical touch does do a lot for people. Mm -hmm. And now we, we didn't get to have that physical touch for uh, so many months and it's still, we still have to do the social distancing. What do you think this will mean for the industry going forward? I believe that we're gonna have strict sanitation um, like we always have. We are required to use hospital grade EPA registered disinfectants for our tools and our combs. Um, but I think it's going to be just a step further uh, with masks in protocol for us to protect 
ourselves now. We were always protecting the clients, but we have to look at protecting ourselves too now. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Well, I know that your customers, as we said, are happy to be back in the chair. Uh, any message that you have for them? <laughs> it seems like in Alpena right now, we're having a hard time with anyone that has a, needs a new stylist. We're getting a lot of calls and like walk-ins. So just have a little bit of patience and book an appointment. You have to, might have to wait a couple weeks, but the walk-in industry is changing mm -hmm. right now. So we're trying to navigate that. I think all across Alpena, um, from the barber to the, to the hairstylist. So book an appointment, have a little bit of patience, and we will be more than happy to take care of you. All right, well, I wanna thank you, Jesse, for spending some time with me today. We really appreciate you. Thank you. Well, that does it for this week's Insights. If you have a question, comment, or story idea, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at news at WBKB11.com. I'm Sherry Stewart. Thank you again for watching. Insights into Northeast Michigan is produced by WBKB News. This has been a production of Thunder Bay Broadcasting Corporation. All rights reserved.